Over the last few years, there's been many reports suggesting that um, the Warrig- the raising of the height of the Warragamba Dam wall, some I think 14 metres, is a suggestion, will have an extremely detrimental effect on much of the bushland, many of the species on, on habitat for those species through the Blue Mountains upstream from the dam. It will also be destructive on First Nations sites, on engravings, on rock paintings and, and art, on other sites of significance through the area. Much of this area uh, remains, you know, somewhat unexplored. It's, you know, there's, we probably only know a handful of what's actually in there. Um, a lot of it's hard to access. A lot of it hasn't had access for many years because it's, it's catchment area and, and the like. We've been hearing that story for a while and recently we've heard also that uh, the uh, scientific advisors to the United Nations have said, this is a bad idea. Blue Mountains could lose its world heritage status if this project proceeds. We're going to talk to Michael Slezak, National Environment Reporter, on some of those issues that have been raised over the last few years. But Councillor Nathan Zampronio joins us first, Liberal Independent Councillor with Hawkesbury City Council. He supports the raising of the dam wall. And I must admit, I'd sort of forgotten uh, what the intent was of the uh, of raising the wall. Nathan Zampronio, good morning. Well, good morning, Jane. Thanks for coming on. What's, what's, the, what's the scheme about? Why, why would you say it's a good idea to raise the dam wall? Well, I'm very glad that you asked because, in my view, the voice of the people who are at greatest risk of flooding is the one that's so often missing from this conversation. There are 140,000 people that live and trade on the Hawkesbury Nepean floodplain. And we are intimately bound with the moods of the Hawkesbury Nepean River. There have been 125 floods since European settlement, some bad, some awful. Uh, And we've been kind of lulled into a false sense of security because the climate gives us slabs of time, 50 years at a stretch, where you either have above average flooding or below average flooding. Mm. When when we had uh, two floods within the last two years, they were the first floods that had happened in over 30 years. And over 30% of the people that that have moved into the area have never experienced a flood. And the one that we had, and I might add, the one that we had last year was a baby. It was a one in 20 type flood, not a very, very bad flood. It it just crossed that threshold of being a major flood. It covered the two major bridges in the Hawkesbury. And the, the effects are absolutely catastrophic. I mean, in this flood, there were 600 houses that were inundated. Yep. And in the event of a very bad flood, we would have to evacuate 90,000 people. There would be 15,500 houses flooded mm. and there'd be up so, to $8 billion worth of damage. So to you, it's a, it's a reasonably simple equation. The dam wall needs to be higher to hold back more water and that'll stop flooding? Yes. The modelling shows that if you were to raise Warragamba Dam, by the amount that's suggested, which I think is about 14 metres, that it would reduce the frequency and severity of floods by 75%. And considering the catastrophic consequences of a flood as bad as the ones that we've seen since European history, then that's money well spent. Yeah. The view I hear is that it's not so much to protect the 140,000 people living there now, although it may, may, may well do that, but it's also then to allow further development on uh, what are now floodplains. Well, I mean, James, what what you're doing at this point is repeating well-worn and frequently refuted untruths. It is not about development on the floodplain. It is not about uh, increasing Sydney's drinking water supply. It is about the safety uh, of life and property on the floodplain. And there's proof. So, you, so you, are you saying you'd be opposed to any further development or you know that no development will ever take place? No, look, I've pinned my political reputation on being opposed to inappropriate development on the floodplain. So I would not be in favour of this if it were about increasing development. They've mm. said that the flood height controls would not change. In other words, the threshold at which you can build, the 1 in 100 limit, which is at about 17 
0.3 metres above the river in Windsor. You cannot build below that line. Now, the only way you could permit more development is if you lowered that threshold and you de-sterilised areas that are currently prohibited for development. Yeah, there'd be a view to say also that perhaps there shouldn't be the development that's there now and the best thing might be to be spending money on better evacuation, on, on you know, better ability to get people out of there, perhaps buying some land back. This would then protect people, uh, protect the area for the future, but also then protect the areas that will be damaged by raising the, the dam wall. Well, that's another untruth. I mean, there is there is no practicality to the prospect of removing people from the floodplain. There are so many people that already live below the historic 1 in 100 threshold because they, they were they were permitted to build before those flood height controls were there, which includes large slabs of the townships of Windsor and uh, Pitt Town and McGrath Hill and, and other areas that I represent on council. So it's just not practical uh, to, to remove people from the floodplain to, to buy back that land. What you have in the uh, strategies that the state government have laid out is a multi-pronged strategy that involves flood evacuation routes, better planning controls, uh, public education and capital works for flood mitigation. Councillor Nathan Zampronio is with us, Liberal Independent Councillor with the Hawkesbury City Council. Michael Slezak, National Environment Reporter, has been covering this for, for quite a while. Michael, good morning. Good morning. How are you going? Does it come down to having to sacrifice some habitat, some First Nation, Nation heritage in order to protect people who are living on uh, living below the dam? Well, look, I, I suppose with these sorts of questions, there's always a, a trade-off that's uh, of that nature, right? It's um, development versus the environment. It's a, kind of the standard trade-off. And in this case, I don't mean necessarily further development on the floodplain, but, you know, the development of, of, the, of this flood mitigation measure, raising the dam. It undoubtedly will have, um, you know, significant environmental impacts um, upstream in the World Heritage Area. Mm. What what is what sort of significant environmental impacts? Yeah. So look, um, the um, what, what we've just reported yesterday was an analysis by the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which um, is the um, UNESCO's, it's the UN's body that that uh, looks after World Heritage. Their um, scientific advisors, and they did an analysis of the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, from the New South Wales government. And um, this is sort of a roundabout way of saying it's not entirely clear what the environmental impacts will be precisely, um, uh, because the IUCN concluded that the EIS was very poorly conducted. So, um, for instance, they said that um, not enough um, survey work was done to see what, um, what would be destroyed in terms of ecological impacts, and um, Indigenous cultural her um, impacts. Um, they concluded that not enough, um, not enough uh, consultation was done with Indigenous people, um, the traditional owners. Um, and it says that um, the government failed to consider the impacts of the recent bushfires, how those overlap with the impacts mm. of the dam um, on, on the area. So, so, so even at a, at a minimum, uh, perhaps we haven't even done the work necessary to determine what raising the dam wall might do. That's, look, that's, that's the conclusion of the IUCN, which, you know, are the world's experts on world heritage. Um, they're saying not enough's been done. They did say that um, despite what the government says, which is that the, the development won't materially impact the what are called the um, outstanding universal values, the values that make it world heritage, they said that the information provided by the government in that inadequate report um, actually shows that it will impact those materially. So they're saying it will damage the heritage value yeah. um, of the site, um, but that not enough work has been done to show how. And it's a pretty extraordinary area. I mean, we're talking about something that's the, where the the just the the bush environment is incredible, and the First Nations heritage env environment is incredible. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Look, it's world heritage for a range of reasons, including its exceptional biodiversity, its wilderness, so untouched, you know, virtually untouched landscape, and its Aboriginal cultural values, as well as other things to do with its um, its, its geology and so on, which are quite unique. Um, and you know, it's quite unusual to have such a such a vast, um, beautiful world heritage area so close to a major city like Sydney. Yeah, Nathan Zampronio, is it of no concept? You know, do you not care about? The, the 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 Blue Mountains World Heritage status about those issues of habitat and First Nation heritage. Australia can be very proud of its environmental credentials. We are uh, a proud 
and often founding members of these multilateral organisations and, and international treaties, and we, we honour the conditions that, that we sign up to. But in terms of this IUCN report, here's a couple of facts that are relevant. The EIS that the government produced took three years to produce and is over 8,000 pages long. The IUCN report that's now being waved around as a kind of a gotcha refutation of that runs to all of four pages. The, hmm. the report that Michael is referring to is four pages long and they received the government's EIS and they produced that four-page report uh, in the space hmm. of about one month. There's been a couple of other you know, rejections of the, of the government's EIC, you know, the Herald Commission to do investigation into it, you know, it's... I don't, I don't know that the length matters that much, Nathan Zambronio. I think it does. The, the IUCN employs over 1,000 full-time staff and has a budget annually of $200 million, and yet all they could say about the EIS that was over 8,000 pages long ran to only four pages, two of which were preamble and conclusion. So I don't see that as a strong refutation of the thoroughness and methodology of the EIS, and I might add, this EIS, the new EIS, comes on top of another EIS that was developed back in the 1990s that took seven years to compile and was ratified mm. by other independent and international experts. Have you, considered, have you considered any other engineering proposal which will keep people safe and keep the dam wall at the, si at the height that it is? Many options were considered and significant to recognise that the government didn't zero in on, on one preordained conclusion. What was examined were... Uh, multiple, multiple alternatives, like building levees, doing dredging, uh, blasting the choke points of, of the river, building dams on other parts of the catchment. It was absolutely the view that the best bang for buck, the best cost-effective uh, thing that you can do is to raise Warragamba Dam because 70% of the uh, waters that come from any given flood, on average, come from behind Warragam. Come from down to there. Uh, Michael Slezak, is, is, is there another solution to this that, that meets both needs? Look, I, I'm not an expert on engineering or, 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 or what the, or, you know, flood engineering and how to solve these sorts of problems. Um, I just kind of report on, on what the experts are saying. And in this case, um, you know, the IUCN, for example, not the only report that has said this, the IUCN report also concluded that not enough work had been done to consider those other alternatives. Um, and that's not the first. That's not the first group to have have made that complaint. Mm. Some other does the length of that report matter? Said it too. Look, I, I don't see why the length of this particular report matters. I mean, these are these are world experts in the matter, and they've provided a very short summary of their views. Um, you know, they've they've also said that they're that they are uh, at the disposal of the government to um, provide more detailed um, uh, responses uh, if they wish. I mm. mean, this is that's you know, it's a very it's a summary of their view. It's not not a detailed report. And do we have an indication of, of where Matt Keane's sitting on this, on where the New South Wales government's sitting on this? Is there a timeline at this point? Uh, look, I think the timelines always stretch out into the future. I think we, we haven't even seen approval by the New South Wales government formally yet, so it's, it'll be months off from that, let alone then um, approval from the federal government. Um, Matt Keane, in terms of his role as treasurer, it's unclear what, what he thinks uh, at the moment. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was thinking if he was environmental minister over the last few years and what where he'd he'd sat, but yes, so it's still some time time off before this is done. But you know, and still perhaps a lot more investigation to be done on uh, on both counts. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Michael Slezak, national environment reporter. Nathan Zampronio, thanks for your time. Always a pleasure. Councillor Nathan Zampronio, Liberal Independent Councillor with Hawkesbury City Councillor.